Okay. So we're on page 69 and we're making our way through a, one, a long Hasidic insight here. Start at the top of the creatures that you may eat. Because we, we all were, were on the, the Zoom last week. This is in the, the third Torah portion in the book of Leviticus. Much of uh, the book is, is um, focused a lot on laws of um, uh, offerings and purity and impurity, a lot of things that are, are not practiced today because we don't have a temple. Uh, so, some of the things we do. And here we went into the a description of which are the kosher species. Kosher food um, starts with something being a kosher species, and then it has to be, if it has to be treated, like an apple, is a kosher species, and you just pick it off the tree. And if it's not someone else's tree, it's you, you can eat it, like a blessing. But you can eat it; it's kosher. When it comes to living beings, we're talking now about um, animals. So whether domestic or wild or light or heavy, there are different um, species that are kosher, and they're not edible just because they're kosher. Those you can't eat. If we say a deer is a kosher animal, which it is, or a, a, a cow is a kosher animal, and if one happened to die on your property, it, that it's not kosher food. It's a kosher species, but it needs to be treated to be able to become kosher. And sometimes it can't be, like uh, an animal that just died naturally. There's no way to make that kosher. So just since I mentioned it, we're going through this, the um, note, the tr creatures that you may eat, which, which was a, a lot about the spiritual significance in two signs that the Torah gives us that tell us whether a, a, an animal is of a kosher species. And one is that it chews its cud. Another one is that it has split hooves. And that's you know clear enough. It's a, there are concrete signs. But we're looking, since food is such an important thing, and it does feed our soul, not just our bodies, we were looking at spiritual significance of the, these signs of the uh, split hooves and, and the chewing the cud, which you want to call rumination. So we are at the very bottom uh, of the second column on the left side of 69. The the seat the the line begins, split feet and rumination, also allude to the two general phases of elevation of the physical world, and go over to the right side of sixty nine with this. And here, what we're saying is that the this we're going to end off now with this this piece. Good morning, with this idea of, already given the ones that we have already spoken about. Um, on, on uh, as far as the, the spiritual significance and lessons in in these two signs of the animals, and we get to something else. And the idea is that in Jewish spirituality, there is a pretty common theme, which is that when um, when we're going to be elevating something physical, first thing we need to do is remove. It's our, our neutralized, it's very, it's coarse uh, physical shackles, so to speak. And then we're able to um, um, inculcate it into a life of spirituality. So for example, and this is not what we're talking about here, but maybe it's a, to me, it's, it, it comes to my mind as a more, as a, as a concrete example, of something I've mentioned in the past that the Talmud gives us advice that one, one um, sets aside, establishes a, a synagogue that the, the, the advice is to have two entryways into the synagogue. And why do we need two entryways? This isn't just simple architectural uh, advice. The two um, entryways into a house of prayer, uh, the commentaries will point out, is that one, walking into shul, one, going through the first doorway is really, it's kind of an exit. It's an exit of 
our normal mindset. It's an exit of our, our very worldly perspective, which tends to be much more concrete, very self-oriented usually, or possibly for sure. And it's it's much more um, it's it's cruder in that sense. So we, uh, the things that are bothering us, the things that run through our minds during the day, we all enter the first um, through the first doorway. We want to try and exit our normal way of thinking, uh, leave ourselves open to a more spiritual, visionary, godly way of thinking. And going through the next doorway is entering that world of prayer. But to enter that world of prayer effectively, you first want to exit. The other, other world. So, in other words, we need both of these doorways. So, um, if I, I had, if I was just eating mixed nuts, so one thing is for me to eat them with not, uh, uh, you know, not purely selfishly, and you know, I, I make a blessing on them, and they they do belong to me. I did buy them, so it's not theft, and and to think that I'm. Look, is this a good thing for me? Because I, God created me to be a human being. I have to have nutrition. I have to eat, and and I have a, a job ahead of me, and to have a, a certain a, a a good intent. Take me out of just the concrete. It's mixed nuts. How you know how how spiritually you're going to get about it? The thing is, the food also it it can be a a a locus and an attraction for self indulgence. And to be able to look and say, you know, I'm hungry. I want to eat something that makes sense for me because I want to be healthy to be who God created me to be. So I'm going to have mixed nuts. That's one thing. So I'm taking it out in a way, if you want to frame it in the Kabbalistic term, you're taking it out of its more crude shell of this is something that's, it's, it's, it's an object of, of, uh, of self-indulgence. I, I like nuts. Once I've, I've done that and I've eaten it in a mature way, now, what am I going to do with it? Now it's in my system. So I want to be able to use that energy to do good things. Because theoretically, I could have eaten uh, breakfast in a, in a very mature, uh, spiritual, visionary way, and then just gone and done nothing with it. So I, I took the food out of its uh, husk of, of selfishness or, or, or very uh, coarser physicality. And now it's in my system. But the, what am I doing with the energy? So... There's two steps here to really what we're going to call in Kabbalistic terms, elevating these nuts. It's that I'm eating them properly. So I've taken it out of the, the, the coarse husk, so to speak. And then I'm going to use the energy to study Torah with people on Zoom uh, and hopefully do good things afterwards. So I've taken something out of the purely physical, and then really integrated the energy, the energy of those nuts into the, the spiritual, studying Torah, that's, that, that's, that's godly. That, those nuts, the energy from the nuts is now subsumed in the mitzvah. So those two steps are what we're going to be looking at right now. It says split feet and rumination also allude to the two general phases of elevation of the physical world, because if you think about it, it's Two, the, there's the split to two sides of the hoof is one thing. There's there's uh, there's uh, the polarity there, and then there's the eating and then eating again. That's chewing the cud. That's rumination. So in other words, there's digesting, the but then we, we have to come back at it and go the next step. The feet, as mentioned above, signify our primary active engagement in physical life through which we elevate the material world out of its materiality by, by harnessing for holy purposes. And we did discuss this last week, that the, my feet are where, yeah, I wouldn't say the rubber hits the road, but where my, my physical body interfaces with the, the material world. I live in a material world, but I'm not usually touching the materiality of it, except through my feet. And that... So that the idea of feet, these hooves, they, they symbolize in the animal, and therefore for us also who are going to be um, ingesting this animal, the idea of en engagement of the physical world. Rumination, in contrast, signifies the secondary, more subtle refinement of the physical world that we have elevated, by which we assimilate it, digested into the realm of pure divine spirituality. Here, I say it's 
a secondary of the split in this note they're splitting into two the engagement and then elevating it so not two in each sometimes it says it that way in other words the primary elevation is the negation of the negative aspects of physicality while the secondary refinement is a positive transformation into holiness so these ideas of the, of the idea like i said before whether it's coming through the doors or eating mixed nuts and, and doing something good with, in a proper way and doing something good with the energy there's that um, two-step process and being um, uh, symbolized either like i said before within the two um, um, approaches to the eating food or the, the, the two different hooves and here we're saying it's one is the hooves is more the, the engagement of the physical world and the rumination is is elevating it to, to a, um, a, and activating its spirituality subsuming it in, in a in a holy endeavor both of these phases should be double just as a kosher animal's uh, feet are split into two and it digests its food twice, every step we take in elevating the physical world should be taken with a mind toward our next step in, in, in elevating the physical world, indicating that our goals in this regard are unlimited. Our aim is to elevate the entire physical world in accordance with God's intention and its creation. Okay, so it's, it's that idea we, we are consistently looking to elevate it to the next step. Similarly, every morsel of the physical world that we quote unquote digest we refine into spirituality should be refined in a higher level for since god is infinite the ascent into divine consciousness is likewise infinite and this is they're, they're pointing out an idea that even if we feel we, that we've taken you know the the energy that we had from breakfast and we've elevated it we ate like a mensch and we've elevated it with a with a good endeavor that there can be more good endeavors. More good endeavors. We want to be able. God is infinite, and uh, and sublimating something and, and encasing it in the, um, within spirituality and holiness has no end. So we can we can keep on trying to 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 uh, refine spiritually refine whatever it is we're, we're dealing with beyond just that second step. It can there be a third step, a fourth step, a fifth step, as much as as you know it, it lasts. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, note number four. It says, you must not eat. Everything in God's creation serves a purpose. And it is our task to, these are the ones you, because uh, we spoke about the animals we should not eat. Everything in God's creation serves a purpose. And it is our task to affect the fulfillment of that purpose. If we say, and this is a very central thing to how we see the world, that God created the world in six days and created all the the elements of the world, the 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 skies and the ground and the the the, the earth and then all all vegetative life and all animal life and then brought humanity, because it's up to humanity to care for that world and to use it properly. So when we engage the physical world whether it's in, in breakfast or whatever our car whatever it is our, our our zoom engaging it for proper purposes is called elevating it zoom the concept is is elevated because it's used to do good things i'm sure that it has a, a strong potential for to use not for good things but our job is to try to to bring the world to a, an elevated place. That is the human mission because we have the capacity for self-awareness that animals don't have. And therefore we have the capacity to rise above, sometimes with difficulty, rise above our impulses, which animals really can't. They can be trained to do something. They just shift the impulse. But the animals don't never you know, decide to go on a diet. It's because they, they follow their impulses and we don't have to do that. So it, our job is to tr try and bring everything to a purposeful place, whether it's Zoom or it's lunch or it's, you know, uh, the, the computer, whatever we're, we're using. So here is a, everything in God's creation serves a purpose or, as our task to fulfill, affect the fulfillment of that purpose. Although in many cases, this requires our active initiative, meaning, through fulfilling an act of commandment through the entity or otherwise using it for a godly purpose. In other cases, it requires us to be passive. Because here is the question they're addressing. 
God created bananas, and God created fish, and God created animals. If I sit down to a breakfast that has, uh, you know, a, 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 a banana and the lox, or I don't know, forget the animals, whatever it is I'm, I'm doing, so I'm engaging the world which is a very Jewish thing to do, and you want to engage it for a purpose and, and, and elevate it. What if I have something non-kosher? What am I supposed to do with that? How do I elevate it? I'm not supposed to, I'm not even supposed to have it. So what, am, what, what is that, where do I go with that? So what, what uh, pointing out here is that sometimes we elevate it by seeing its purpose as Need to test our discipline. When God told Adam and Eve, you have a whole world before you. It was a mature world. There was plenty to eat. And the, 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 at that point, they were vegetarians. So there wasn't talking about meat. But the, the verse says, that God said to them, you can eat from all the fruits of this garden. So they're in good shape. Plenty of food. The only thing is from that, tree in the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat that. So everything, their job was to bring purpose and meaning, to actualize the purpose and meaning of fruits of the, of the, of the, of the garden. What was the purpose of, what, what, could, what involvement could they have had? How could they have elevated that tree that they're not allowed to eat from? They could have elevated that by not eating from it. By seeing that this is a tree that, that for whatever reason, God said, don't eat from it, that's their only prohibition. They can have everything else. So therefore, God is obviously giving some, something to, for them to exercise self-discipline not to eat. So exercising that self-discipline brings meaning to God's plan. Here, you, these things you do eat, but I want you to have some self-discipline. Don't eat that. And everything would have been fine. And that would have brought meaning to the idea of this, this tree because, aside from whatever God, meaning God had, it, because now they fulfilled its purpose by not eating it, by seeing it as something that is important in the sense that it's, it's, it's something, a, 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 an object for them to avoid and for them to exercise their own capacity for self-discipline. Yes, Debbie. Um, so are you saying that when we don't eat pork that we're elevating all pigs? Um, is, is it like an effort that, to make, do that? Uh, uh, it, that's, uh, it's a capitalistic concept. Um, actually, uh, my son Nehemi just uh, had to give a, a talk in yeshiva last week and it, it, it involved this. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's, it, it's in concept. So let, let's make it a little more real. I don't have much access to pigs. I don't have much access to pork or bacon. So therefore, um, I don't I can't say in any honesty that my not eating pig is elevating any pigs because I, I have no struggle there. Right. It's only if it takes effort, like if you're it's, with pizza eating, eating right. pepperoni so pizza. I, I was really hungry one day and there's it's sitting right there. No one's watching. And I and I and I and I the, the, it looked attractive to me, but I said, I can't do that. That's not for me. That yes, that elevates. Okay, and a separate kind of a side note, if it's not too distracting, that I did also recently learn that um, actually we may have eaten meat before. Um, it was approved by God, but we just, we had to only, we could only eat meat that was already dead. Like we couldn't kill animals. We were just given the ability to kill animals, but we were allowed to eat them before, just they had to already be dead, which is correct. ironic because now we, we yeah, can't correct. eat them already dead. I, I, I was, I... In my desire to to not get too complicated, I I was uh, I oversimplified that there is a debate. It it seems pre, put it this way, they're told to eat um, vegetative life, and then after the the flood, God says now you can eat meat. So for us to say that they were vegetarian, that kind of that that is pretty much it, it's a fair statement but you're correct there are um opinions uh, worthy opinions who will say that what they were not allowed to kill for food that if something naturally died they were able to eat it 
Correct. So it, my statement that they were vegetarians needs an ask, asterisk or probably needs a little explanation. It's not so clear. Okay. You're, I, I only point it out because it's it's often used as a reason to become a vegetarian, which people can choose to do for health or whatever reasons, right. but it shouldn't be because of that. So. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that that also, uh, if if you're hanging the hat on that, then why well, you can't ignore what God says afterwards to know it? And now you can. So I don't. I mean, he never says to them you can't eat meat. And I, he never says I think they see so, it as like purer and earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and by the way, so, I mean again, so, you, people can be vegetarians, but it shouldn't be because of that. Um, Kabbalists, right. uh, if, if you feel the way, Rabbi Cook, who the First chief rabbi, chief rabbi of Israel, he writes that in the times of Mashiach, we're going to be um, vegetarians. He, he was of that, that uh, way of thinking. That's Would it. we still be killing animals, though, right, for sacrifices or no? He, he That's a debate. He's he's mm -hmm. not so sure about that either. But um, it, it's it's uh, I think it's 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 a fair conversation um, in, okay. in today's uh, Jewish life. At least the Friday night, really, we should be eating uh, or Friday night Shabbos, we should be eating at least a little bit of meat. Okay. okay. All right. Back. Um, ideally. All right. So now, so here's it requires us to be passive, meaning through fulfilling a past commandment with the entry, you're otherwise avoiding it. But even when God commands us to avoid something, we still thereby elevate it. But as Debbie pointed out, yes, yeah, so sitting here right now on, on, on the Zoom, I, 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 let's assume none of us are eating anything and none of us are therefore eating any treif, so we just fulfilled a lot of mitzvahs by, by uh, passively saying, we, we, you know, we didn't do those prohibitions. That's a, you know, it's a stretch. But the idea is that by, when when there we do have an impulse in that direction and we control it, that is, that elevates. It's the idea. It's, this is why it exists. Now, God commands us not to consume non-kosher animals since they originate in the realm of spirituality that is beyond our ability to elevate through eating. And this is a, a, an important capitalistic idea. It, it doesn't, you know, it, there's nothing morally evil about a pig. Uh, a pig is just an animal. It doesn't make moral choices. But the I, idea is the Hebrew word <clears throat> for forbidden is asur. Hebrew word for permitted is mutar. Those very same Hebrew words mean um, and, and are used to mean that something is like bound, like tied down or imprisoned. Like a, a, a jail in, in the Torah calls a, 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 a beta asurim, which means a place of, only, like not a forbidden objects, but tied down. And mutar means free. So what, is, what does that mean? It means that a, a kosher burger or a tofu burger um, is mutar, means that I can elevate this. I can make a blessing on it, eat it properly, use the, the, the energy to do something good. And I have now um, taken something and <clears throat> plugged it into the vine, subsumed it within the divine. If I do that with a non-kosher burger, even if I eat, I make a blessing, and I, I make uh, and I, I eat like a mensch, and I uh, and I uh, study Torah afterwards, that's not going anywhere. The language is it's tied down; it's not elevatable. Why is it not elevatable? That's God's bookkeeping, but it's not elevatable. So God tells us that for us, these animals. Are not are not elevatable. They're asur. Asur again means it means forbidden. It means tied down. The reason, the reason they're not up, they're forbidden, is because we can't elevate them. Yes, then. Um, can they be elevated by Christians when they pray before their meals? That's a, a great question. I think that they can be used and 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 um, and uh, and achieve a purpose in their existence. Yeah. Through yes, if, if I, uh, my uh, my Christian neighbor sits and eats and uses it properly and uses the energy properly, that is a level of this type of elevation. Um, we're talking now more about within the the, the Torah lane of elevation, which is that it, it, it's a it's a different lane. 
that's not possible for my, my Christian friend, but certainly um, uh, them, uh, my Christian friends using the world for, uh, for good purpose brings meaning to the world and brings meaning to the things that they're using. And if it's not, okay. Christian, that's great. The, their, their prayers about food or blessings before meals just serve a serve a different purpose they don't really have the same effect right it's not it, it, right it's not it, it's not identical but it's, it's a a not my my non-jewish neighbor has a mitzvah to believe in god um i have a mitzvah to believe in god now it's not exactly the same they're called mitzvah but they're not exactly the same type of mitzvah or same same character of what the mitzvah is but they are um but they're all mitzvahs and therefore from if my John Jewish neighbor sits down to have bacon and eggs this morning and says, thank you, God, for creating a world and allowing me to eat this bacon and eggs and eats, eats to not in a gluttonous way, but eats in a responsible way and then goes and, and helps, you know, feed a, a soup kitchen. Certainly that it, not non-Jewish neighbor is doing exactly what God wants him or her to do. And is taking the world along with him or her to a to a meaningful place. Um, the the idea of the elevation of what we can do in plugging an animal into holiness through um, uh, eating uh, a kosher uh, cow or Friday night shabbos or so on it's it's it, it's bringing meaning at a different level. So I wouldn't I wouldn't put them both all in, in the same basket, but generally speaking, it is the same concept. Yes. It, it, we're getting more there into, I guess, some of the Kabbalistic uh, uh, bookkeeping. All right. So we elevate them, we say, by, by fulfilling God's commandments, so stay, uh, abstain from eating them. Good morning, Arella um, and Lori, somewhere on 69, all the way to the right. Now, he brings up something else. There's another way of, of bringing meaning to non-kosher creatures. Use them for a good purpose. I don't have to eat them, but I can use them. They can be part of my my farm. So it, these animals can be elevated directly and actively by by using them for purposes other than eating. For example, when a donkey or a horse transports transports a person to perform a commandment, it too is infused with holiness. So if in in days when we would ride horses, and if so if the horse, just like I say, you know, if you use your car today to travel, to visit someone who needs who, who needs a, a smile and a hug, or to go do a mitzvah somewhere, or to help someone put up a mezuzah, your, your car is a vehicle, really a vehicle, for holiness. And it is part of that calculus, of that equation. And you're, you're making your car, your things, part of that, that, that march toward a life, uh, to a life of holiness. And the car, even if it was a physical car, it has no moral uh, decision making, obviously. But the fact is, you, you're bringing your things along with you into this life of holiness. If I'm doing that with a, a horse, I, I'm riding a horse. A horse is no less possible to to elevate than uh, a car. Elevation through eating is a very is a special type of elevation because then it becomes part of, of, of you, connects with your soul, the energy is used differently. So that it's it's a higher le level of elevation. But riding the horse is also an elevation. So question here: so birds of prey can be used by a Jewish farmer to rid their farm of rodents? Absolutely. And 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 I think that would, so that's a that's a kosher usage, so to speak, and certainly something where we we are engaging the world for a good purpose. Can't eat those birds of prey, but at least we can use them in a, in a, in a good way. By utilizing everything in our lives for fulfilling our divine mission, we sanctify all aspects of reality with which divine providence has put us in contact. Okay. So now, we finished the Hasidic insights. Now we'll go down to the closer look. And this the is a really important thing that they bring in here it's this is not it's so much an interpretation but it's a very important idea we're going to go go into different species which is what we're going to be doing it says the following are the creatures so the torah is 
um, what happens is that the Torah is going to name a few. We, we named the Torah is going to name signs that help us identify a kosher animal, which is chewing, cut, and, and split hooves, and then will identify several species which have one and not the other. In other words, the inferences, and we'll, we'll talk about it, the inference is that if, if um, and the Talmud talks about it, that, that if an animal that split, has split hooves almost definitely has, um, it chooses its God and vice versa. There are these exceptions to that zoological rule, which is that um, these animals have one and not the other. They chew their cut, but don't have split hooves, but have split hooves and don't, don't chew their cut. So it does name a few species. It's going to name, it's, it's going to give us, without any names, signs for fish. It has uh, fins and scales. And then it's going to go into birds where it's going to name a bunch of different species in biblical Hebrew. So we have here, we're going to have a few species. Then we're going to have more than that when we come to the birds. So here what we're saying is the following are the creatures. Although many of the names of the animals in the following lists and the list in Deuteronomy 14, 4, 18, because Moses repeats this whole idea when he repeats everything at the end of the Torah, when he goes through a reprise of everything the last weeks of his life, he goes through the, the, the kosher species again. Although, although many of these things may be considered precise translations of the Hebrew terms, others are only educated guesses. For this reason, the only animals permitted for consumption today are those for which there is an established tradition of them being sold. It's very difficult for us to know what what it, 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 and what a specific animal was called 3,300 years ago in Hebrew. And this is serious business because kosher is serious business. So if someone told me that here's a, I made a salad, I put in mushroom from my backyard um, and it based on what our interpretation of what um, are safe mushrooms written in a book in, in Greek 3,300 years ago, this is safe. I'm not sure I would eat the, the, uh, the salad because who says that they're interpreting it correctly? Well, kosher is, is, is serious business. It's spiritual help. So for us to, to say this Hebrew word is translated as this. It's very. It, it's it's difficult to do that unless there's a, a specific tradition. So a lot of these these um, names, and the more one studies zoology, and I, I have not, but I have looked into it for different things in, in the understanding, the Torah understanding. There are different shades of different animals, and when I the, the idea of what the Torah is referring to, we cannot assume. We know I have books, Jewish Torah books devoted to study of animals by people who are fully engaged in zoology because there are things, even myself as a student, I'll look and say, okay, this word means deer. I've, been, I've studied that my, my whole life. A, a tzvi is a deer. And then I'll study something in the Talmud and the way it describes the deer is not the way I see the deer. And then I learned that there are actually different types. Maybe deer doesn't mean deer. Maybe it means gazelle. It, it's, we have to be very careful about this. So the the um, when it, especially when it comes to when it comes to animals, you just it really doesn't make that much of a difference because if it chooses its cut and it has split hooves, who cares what you call it? But here, this is a um, it, when when it's about the name, it's it's iffy, and that's why some of the things are probably not going to to uh, um, translate. I don't remember if they do or not. Some chumashim don't, even though we have conventional translations. Hey, one thing that I know, and we're, we're not up to it now, we'll go get it. I, I I don't particularly like turkey, but I eat it. Um, and it's accepted as kosher in the, in the Torah community. There is one family I know of, a, a family of, of someone who lived, descendants of someone who lived in the 1500s, 1600s. Their family tradition was that turkey is not kosher. 
that's their business. Uh, it, it, it's not binding on me, but it was, it's there within the tradition because it's a question of translations. And translations are not going to always be so so simple. Debbie, you asking something? Um, yeah, I um, I understand what you're saying in terms of the definitions of. I've always heard it related to like birds and and sea animals. Um, and I know in mammals we define species perhaps differently than was done in the past. But I always thought that the specific examples given of animals in the Torah that have one trait but not another were were like one of the proofs for those, you know, following that line of thought that the Torah was given by God, because how in the world could anybody have known that there were literally only these couple of animals that have one trait, but not the other, and we've never found another one. That's good. So correct. were those specific ones, at least, one right. that you're pretty sure about? So, I'm with you on that, and I, I see that as very meaningful, too, that to hear that the Torah pulls out these four examples of one that, uh, of animals that have one and not the other, um, and and I, I actually, I heard about something, I think it was in Australia, you know, it's a, 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 a species that was found years ago that uh, has one and not the other. And when I checked into it, it was, it was actually part of, a, a part of the larger family of one of these species. Mm -hmm. But what I have seen, and that's where I went with it, is that even in the, the translation of some of these things, it's you know whether the the hyrax i mean we're going to actually we're going to get it into the closer look what we call the hyrax is not observed to chew its cut mm -hmm. so we i mean it's i think we have to this is something that uh, the rabbis of the talmud observed certain animals and they said these are the ones that the torah was talking about and look all those four animals have this exception to the zoological rule, and we can't find anything else. Whether the, the rabbis in Tal Talmud didn't call it a hyrax. Mm. So we, we got to be careful just because we want to be intellectually honest about it. Torah is Torah. This is what the, the Torah says. I believe it. It has been one of those cases where it's you, you can see the Torah's um, timeless wisdom. And that's the way I, 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 I grew up with that. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're saying here, and I, I think that's probably the reason I said it, is that Hyrax, not, it's not so clear in, in the Hyrax as we see it now. And there are things that we see, you know, nature also, it, it goes through it, its, its cycles. I was just studying something about the, the, the eagle I was described in the Talmud about the eagle goes through, uh, loses some of its wings, its feathers. feathers. So, um, but the way it's described, and whenever I see something in the Talmud or in the Torah, I, I, I want to Google see how, how does modern science look at it because it's interesting to me. So the way it, it, uh, it's seen today is similar to the way it's described in the, Torah, in the Talmud, but it's not exact. Now, I fully... I'm fully confident that anyone, Rabbi in the Talmud, who was talking about it, saw it for themselves. Uh, now, so what does that mean? Was that a different type of eagle? Or has the, you know, you know, nature of eagles somewhat evolved? I don't know. But I think there's room for both of them. Uh, either a, 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 you know, a nuance in the translation or... You know, it, as uh, over thousands of years, maybe something shifted. There, there are a few things like that that I that I know of that I myself have experienced where I I'm looking at something where someone two thousand years ago is 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 saying what they're observing, and it seems like it's not observable right now. Well, regardless of the name, there are very few animals that have both, so we can even yes, yes, that yeah, that's true, definitely. Okay. So now we're going to go to the to page seventy, um, and it says. That, so these are the ones we don't um, eat. The hyrax, which is figure two, because it regurgitates its cud, but does not have completely cloven feet. Eating it renders you spiritually defiled. It's it is not kosher, and it also 
there's a, a second type of, of defilement of impurity, which we, we spoke about and we'll speak about going further, is it's not only it's not kosher, but if I ate it, I can't go into the temple because, or if I touched it even, I can't go into the temple because it's considered um, spiritually um, impure. Now let's go to the closer look on, on uh, actually do, do verse six, and then we'll go back to it. And the hair, because a regurgitator takes its cut, but does not have completely cloven feet, eating or renders you spiritually defiled. Verse five, six, the hyrax and the hair. The hyrax has not been observed to chew its cud. However, its digestive system is somewhat similar to that of ruminants. The time it takes to digest food is similar to that of ruminants. It can digest fiber as ruminants can. It chews laterally, laterally and even when not grazing, as ruminants do. And it possibly regurgitates and retrieves some of its food. So this is something, um, I told you, I have books on this, and this is one of the things that, that is, is spoken about, is this, um, the hyrax, is the, the, the shafon in Hebrew, is it, is it just such a simply observable thing that it, it, it regurgitates its food and doesn't have split hooves? It's if you go and watch the hyrax, you may not see it that way. Um, so now we're going to we'll look and say again, we, ha we have to uh, allow for a few certain possibilities. A, the Hebrew shafon doesn't actually mean hyrax. B, the hyrax. His nature has somewhat shifted over time. Or C, what the Torah means is not the chewing of the cud in the way a cow does it, but about its digestive system and these other similarities and that are not found in non-ruminants. The hair has also been not been observed to chew its cud. However, in order to fully digest its food, it often re-ingests some of it in the form of specialized pellets that it excretes for this purpose. This process is called psychotrophy. Sec and its chewing habits can also resemble those of ruminants. So this is in the question of the definition. I'm, having watched a cow, which I, I can see, and I know what it looks like to chew its cud, if I was going to look at a hyrax and a hare, if they stood still for me, I might expect to see the same thing. What we're saying is, because Torah is addressing the real world, if indeed the shofan and the arnevet are the hyrax and the hare, we're not going to see it in that way, although we can see what they do, how they do act, and say it fits into the general um, rubric of ruminants, or or something has has shifted in them. These characteristics can be can be sufficient to include these animals in the Torah's description of chewing the cud. It is also possible that the Hebrew terms refer to animals that are no longer extant. We don't know. There's no, the Torah doesn't give us pictures. From the way the, the, the Shafan and the Arnevits are, are described, not only here, the way they come up, people who, who know this stuff, and it's not me, they, they decided, they defined the Shafan as, as a Hyrex and, and the Arnevit as a hare. But we have to leave open the possibility to say it actually meant something else. And the, the, the zoological geniuses who are, who are trying to figure this out are only looking at, at, at species that exist today. So there, there was a different type of, of probably maybe of hyrax or hair. Okay. Now just the, for, for our uh, Jewish fun facts, um, the, the Hebrew word for arnevet is hair. We, we do it. There is an interesting, if, uh, you all may have heard of the Septuagint. Septuagint is the, the first translation of the Torah into Greek, which King Ptolemy um, commissioned. And he, he had, he put 70 sages, the, it's, the Septu was, there were 70 sages, um, Torah sages who he put under guard in different rooms to translate for him um, because he was someone who was a, a, a learned person. He built huge libraries and he wanted the Torah translated into Greek so he could understand it. And he didn't want the Jews conspiring to, to hide anything from him. So he had them each do it and, and told them that if, if you, your uh, translation is different than everyone else's, 
I, I, you know, I, you can die for this. I don't want you hiding anything from me. So the Talmud says that they they all miraculously they all decided to make certain changes which they felt could be misperceived. And one of them is actually this Arnevet. Arnevet we translate it as a hair. His wife's name was um, either, I guess it was hair, or Nevit, but they, they could not, they did not want to translate our Nevit as a, as a hair because that would mean that it had, that she's not kosher. And the, the, he would see that as putting her in a, in a bad light. So they all wrote the, a short legged creature. They all, all 70 of them, or 71, different, uh, or 72, there are different uh, versions of how many uh, rabbis it was, but they all came up with the same exact translation that it, be, that it was this, uh, they, they translated this Arnevit as a short legged creature, not to um, uh, have any, bring any perceived offense to, Tom, uh, to King Ptolemy and his wife. Okay. And number seven, we say, and the pig, because it has cloven feet that are completely split, but does not regurgitate its cut, eating it renders you spiritually defiled. So a, a pig, it's interesting that a pig, there's a lot of non-kosher, but the pig, I think to many people, it's the symbol of non-kosher. Even in Yiddish, we say, it's It's not just treif, not kosher. It's chazetre. Chazetre is, is the Hebrew word for, for pig. What about salamander treif or, or cat treif? Oh, we can't eat cats. They're not, they're not kosher. The idea of pig, and then people have told me, I don't, I don't keep kosher, but I don't, I don't eat pork products. Okay. It's, it, they're not kosher. It's good not to eat pork, pork products. It, it's, there, there's a special sensitivity to it. Um, where does that come from? I don't know if anyone is sure. Just on, on you know, at one level, we say that was a, it seems that that was a, a symbol that used by the Roman legions. Maybe that's why it became very sensitized to it. The Talmud also not answering the question of why we're so sensitive to it, but also pulls out the one of the things about the, the pig, and that the pig has its feet are cloven. So the language of the Talmud is this. So here you have something, it's a symbol of a, a non-kosher entity who puts out its paws and says, no, look, I'm kosher. Because that's what's readily visible and, and the, the, the rumination is not. So it became a symbol for religious hypocrisy where uh, I'll show you, my, look at my paws, I'm kosher. Because it does have split hooves. But it's not it's not a kosher animal. Now another thing to throw in here is there is a, a one of our our um, the medieval greats known as Rabbeinu Bechaya, Bechaya ben Asher, lived in Spain. He writes he has in his book that this uh, the Medrash teaches that. The, the pig is called Chazir. And Chazir, the, the Hebrew of it, if you were just looking at this and you didn't know it was talking about animals, Chazir, the, the, the root of that is to, to return. Like uh, a, a person who, who has become observant, uh, was not, did not grow up observant, became observant in Hebrew is called a Chazir, returned to God. In, in, in connection to God, we call it a bal teshuva. So, it, it, chazir means to return. So, Rabbeinu Bechaya writes that the Medr says that in the times of Mashiach, this will return to being kosher. The the, the pig, which is an interesting thing. First of all, that. Pickle be kosher in times of Mashiach. Second of all, it's returned to being kosher as though it, it once was. It's a a um, a very a, 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 an eye a uh, an eyebrow raising medrash 
We don't have it. We don't find that in any of our medish. Rabbeinu B'chai is a, a very, very worthy source. And if he saw it in a medish, it must have been an addition he saw. But we, in our editions of the medish, it does not appear. So he's quoted, and the idea is quoted, but it's always with an asterisk. That's, we have no idea where, what, what this medish says because we don't have the medish. But because he's a person of such stature, it's not just dismissed as, as you know, uh, folklore or urban myth or a mistake. Because if Rabbeinu Pachayis wrote it, he had something to base it on. We're just not seeing what it was. It does, it does give us, I remember someone uh, was doing, a, a, a Jewish boy was doing a, his PhD on pigs. And he, he came to interview a local boy. And he came to interview me about it because, you know, how do you write about pigs without talking about kosher? And we went into this. Also, the idea of of the that as much as it, it is the symbol of non-kosher, it has one of the two kosher symbols. And there's even this idea that one day it will be kosher. So it's it's interesting that it seems to have two poles where in a way you could say it's like half kosher, or that it's 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 gonna be kosher. And on the other hand, that is the symbol of absolute treif. Okay. So now let's just go a little further. You must not eat them because they exhibit only one of the two signs of permitted animals. Similarly, you must not eat other animals that exhibit only one of the two signs and certainly not animals that ex exhibit neither of the two signs. Here they say certainly. Another. Nonetheless, you transgress the prohibition against eating such animals only by eating their flesh. Not of their bones, sinews, horns, or hooves. If you eat these, you transgress only the act of commandment to eat, but only eat um, permitted animals. So eating something that's not edible is not a is technically not eating treif. Actually, someone here once asked me about a certain type of uh, Yogurt or Jello, actually, and I it, that it seemed to have animal products in it and had a, a hersher, so kosher. So I called the, the supervising agency it was in upstate New York, and they they said that it's because it's really just ground um, sinews uh, and things that are not edible. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't have gone with that as a, as a, something to eat, but they were basing it on this. Okay. In contrast to eating these animals, which renders you spiritually defiled, touching or carrying the carcass of these, these animals renders you ritually defiled, as it will be seen presently. So there's a thing of eating, person eating, actually shouldn't eating a, a, a pig, which is it's eating treif, and that's a spiritual problem, toxicity for my soul. But then there's something else. The fact that I touched it or ate it means that I have a certain a spiritual imbalance or a ritual imbalance, which means I can't uh, eat of, of sacred things, not because it's safe, because it was from, from this animal. And therefore, I can't, um, I, I can't go into the temple or whatever it may be. So they're distinguishing between spiritual defilement, in other words, the ingesting of water dust from my soul, the spirituality, are the ritual end. Contracting ritual defilement requires you to ritually purify yourself before entering the tabernacle precincts or eating consecrated food. When a person has ritual defilement, they didn't do anything wrong. Eating a pig is, I, I violated a, a, a commandment to the Torah. Touching the pig isn't violating anything. It just throws me off, off from my ritual needs. So, there, contracting ritual defilement requires you to ritually prepare yourself before entering the tabernacle. If precincts are eating consecrated food, you have to wait to go to the mikveh. Although you're not allowed to spiritually devour yourselves by eating these animals, although we are prohibited from eating, let's use the pig as an example, you are allowed to ritually defy yourself by touching or carrying the carcasses as long as you understand the ramifications of doing so. I can touch a pig. And especially today, I'm not going into any temple. I, I haven't violated anything total by touching a pig, petting a pig. But eating a pig, obviously, then that's eating pork products, which are totally capped. 
The only time we would be careful about not touching these things, the only exception to this is the pilgrim festivals, because people would come to Jerusalem and they would conceivably come to the temple and bring offerings, during which you must not touch their carcasses because doing so re re renders you ritually defiled. Now, and if you happen to have been ritually defiled before the festival, or you happen to become ritually defiled during the festival, you must purify yourself in honor of the festival. So really, the easy way to describe this, explain this, is, is it's about going to the temple. But in truth, it's not only about that. Before any yomtiv, we want to be in a, in a holy state. It is common to, I mean, it's maybe not to, it's not uncommon for people to go to the mikvah before a, a holiday. Because it, just like you're going to put on, uh, put out good food and put on a, a, a nice set of clothes, you want to be in a, in a good spiritual place to go to the mikvah. So doing this, um, handling non-kosher animals during or immediately before the festival is not considered uh, advisable. Or as you've been taught, you must celebrate the pilgrim festivals by wearing fine clothes and eating and drinking special foods. And you can only consecrate these days through such mundane acts if you do so in a state of ritual purity. These obligations apply whether or not you plan on actually, actually plan on entering the tabernacle precincts, even when the tabernacle is not standing. So these are things that the Torah is talking to us about, talks to us about not ingesting, but it actually also goes to the idea of not touching and not, not um, coming to a place of this lack of purification. Um, this weekend, this coming weekend is the International Conference of Chabad rabbis, 4,000 people are coming in, I don't know how many. Um, I will be here for Shabbos, but, and I, and I hope to give our class on Sunday, but Tuesday morning, this time, I have to be in Brooklyn for uh, meetings connected to the, the conference, so I won't be able to uh, be, meet the list uh, next Tuesday, but we should be fine, God willing, the following Tuesday. And I Apologize for not being around this coming Tuesday. Thanks for the warning. Yeah, okay. So we won't be as disappointed, but yes, I hope the conference is great. God willing, yeah, it's always good. To, the the, uh, the banquet, the annual banquet, which is Sunday evening, is going to be in Edison, New Jersey. So I, I don't have to. Convenient. Fun. Yeah, works for me. <laughs> Enjoy it, Mendy. Thank you. You're welcome. You will. Have a great week. You will. Thank you. Bye-bye.